my professional experience that separates me. It's really about your commitment and your passion. First time candidates Chapalo Street and Amija Smith are in a tight race to represent the 37th legislative district in Olympia. We connect on our values. How are friends and young folks gonna buy houses? Both say the state needs to increase help for historically underserved areas in South Seattle and Renton by improving education and economic opportunity, adding transit options and more. We need a police force to partner with. Whom should voters send to Olympia? We want to change status quo. The race to become the 37th legislative district's next state representative, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Earlier this year, 37th District Representative Kirsten harris Talley made the unexpected decision not to run again after just one term. And now, two political newcomers are vying for her seat. Chapalo Street, a tech advisor and small business owner, and Imija Smith, a community organizer and PTSA president. Street won the August primary in a four-candidate field, but Smith is counting on her deep community ties to come back in November. This week, we're previewing the race to represent one of the most diverse areas of our state, the 37th District, featuring two candidates with diverse backgrounds eager for your vote. I'm Chapalo. I'm running for state legislature here in the 37th. Chapalo Street is on the street looking for votes after Kirsten harris Talley's surprising decision not to run again as state representative of the 37th district in southeast Seattle and Renton. This is the race that, frankly, no one expected to have happened. Street touts his professional experience as a union member and especially as a Microsoft senior advisor to the chief technology officer, providing a tech savvy he wants to apply to many top issues, including the battle over reproductive rights. We have instances where people are using other people's data to go after people getting abortions or providing abortions. And so understanding how we can limit and control our data um, to be used in ways that we want and protect it from being used in ways that we don't want is really important. Street was the front runner in the August primary, earning 41.5% of the vote. He's raised more than $106,000 for his campaign as of mid-September and is endorsed by The Stranger newspaper, The Seattle Times, former 37th District Rep Eric Pettigrew, and the Service Employees Union, SEIU 775. Hopefully I can earn your vote. Yeah. As a small business owner and landlord, Street says his top issues include building more affordable housing for the 37th District, providing rental assistance, and adding density around transit. The CD and the 37th used to be the most diverse district in the country. Um, however, as housing prices have risen, people have been pushed out farther and farther. We need to make sure that stops. In a district where gun violence is a continuing problem, Street supports restricting access to firearms and adding mental health resources for emergency service calls. We just need to think more comprehensively about public safety and what that means as more than just police officers and how do we really get the best outcomes for the community. And I think if we do that, we'll also have a better relationship with the police force. For Imija Smith, it's all about community and the power of her voice as an advocate. I'm locking arms with folks to go to Olympia. Smith, who has worked in health care and homeless advocacy, is currently president of the Mercer International Middle School PTSA and is a member of a half dozen local boards and committees. My name is Imaja Smith. I'm a community queen. Smith says she spent the last 15 years advocating in Olympia for racial justice and economic development in her neighborhood. And now it's time for her to take a leadership role. I'm everyday people and I want anybody to know that our voice is powerful. We can testify, we can call elected officials, but we could also do the job. So I'm here representing that I have the lived experience, the actual advocacy and legislative experience. Smith earned more than 35% of the vote in the August primary and has raised more than $84,000 for her campaign. She's endorsed by Pro-Choice Washington, the Washington State Labor Council, One America Votes, and the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. I have nothing but great energy right now. Smith says her priorities include providing equitable access to health care as we come out of the pandemic, getting more resources to people with low incomes, and supporting early learning up through higher learning. You know, I have children myself. I have a grandchild. So those things are very important to me. 
Stability for our families, stable housing, good education, food security, health, those will be our top priorities for me. She's also advocating for improvements in mental health services and increased protections against domestic violence. And as someone who grew up in the 37th district, she says it's her time. It's really about your commitment and your passion and what you really wanna bring back to our community so that we leave it better than the way we found it. And now it's time for that community to vote for a new 37th district representative in position two. And we have with us the two candidates for the 37th District State Representative Position 2. That's Amija Smith and Chapalo Street. Thank you very much for joining me. Had a coin flip before the show. Chapalo, you'll be speaking first here. Why are you running for this job? Please keep it to about a minute, please. Sounds great. So I'm an innovative problem solver who's been giving back to the community for over 15 years. Like there's just so many large issues that are affecting our communities, communities today from like housing and homelessness to education funding to environmental and social justice that we really need to find ways to move our community forwards. And so I've been doing that for 15 years. Like um, I worked at a school down in South Seattle and volunteer taught computer science there to close the digital divide. Um, I've worked at United Way of King County advocating for policy to make sure that um, the most underserved communities are well served. Um, I fight for equity in all spaces I go to. That includes the team I hired at Microsoft to even my campaign team here um, in this race. So I think it's really important that we have people who can move our community forward. And I also bring some unique experience to this race. I work at Microsoft. I think it's really important that we have people who understand technology in the legislature, especially given Roe, because we don't want people using our data going after people seeking abortions or providing abortions. So I'm excited to be here today. I'd love to talk about some of these really big issues and how we move our, our community forward. And we'll peel apart some of those in just a minute, but Amaja, you're next. An opening statement of why you're running. Keep it to about a minute, please. Thank you. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I've been raised and rooted in the 37th for my lifetime. Basically, I've been doing legislative advocacy and community organizing pretty much uh, since I was a teen. Um, I've been locked arms with families and youth going to Olympia, really using the power of our voice to bring meaningful change. And so when I realized that how powerful we are and things that we have, you know, the wins that we've brought, the wins such as um, community developments, Africatown Plaza, Ethiopian Village, Elizabeth Thomas Homes, as well as the PETA Village, really bringing in real housing, um, bringing in revenue dollars from the marijuana uh, tax dollars, um, justice reform. I mean, we as families and community members have been doing it for some time, so I've stepped into the race because I understand we need a both and approach. We need the power of our voice, and we also need the power of that vote as a representative. And so I know that I am cred I'm credible, I'm vetted in community, I'm a bridge builder, and I'll definitely bring voice to those who feel like they're voiceless, but also just really understanding from the canvassing that I've been doing um, that we wanna change status quo in Olympia. And so that's why I'm here and that's why I'm the deserving candidate. Got Thank it, you. thank you for breaking that down. And you're going down a path that I'd like for you to continue. And Amaja, I'll start with you here. Both of you are new to politics, and so I wanna make sure voters get the story straight from you. You talk a lot about your community connections, and I, I'm trying to figure out what is exactly about that background and experience that differentiates you from your opponent here. You know, I don't know about how new I am to politics. I think when we think about our country, that it's all about policy, there's rules, there's laws. I am a descendant of stolen ones. From, this, um, from the United States. And so I've my whole life been understanding the different, what politics, meaning the right to vote, right? Where you go to school, uh, redlining. Um, what differentiates us though, at the end of the day is really demonstrated experience. I have the experience being in Olympia, providing the workshops to the families, really bringing in real change, sitting on current coalitions, currently around housing equity, around justice reform. So I think that's what separates us and also the fact that I am a parent and a grandparent. So I really have been navigating those systems and really been on the front line with families with regard to our Seattle public schools, with regard of um, making sure that we're getting fully funded education, mm -hmm. you know, being on the front line with union workers for striking. So I've been doing the work, demonstrating the work and currently do the work. So I'm not new to this. Okay. It's All right. truly hard work for me. All right. Uh, Chapalo, same question to you about your background, your life experience, and you've touched on this, how it differs from your opponents here. And how does that separate you, I guess, as the better person for the job? First, for sure, I'd say I have comprehensive experience. So um, I might just talked about some great work in the community. I've also done very good work um, advocating for policy as part of the United Way. Um, Public Policy Impact Council. Um, I have unique professional experience, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, there is a lack of 
technology expertise in the legislature. Um, there's a lack of technology expertise in our country in this area. Not only do we need to bring it to the legislature, we need to bring it to our education system so that our kids can have a chance to take part in the industry that's changing our community. Um, I also have given back the community in sort of grassroots ways. I was a professional soccer referee. I've worked with organizations to try and increase diversity within the refereeing community. For example, going to El Centro de la Raza and trying to bring in more diverse voices into the referee community. I've been a member of a union. Um, I'm the only candidate who's been a member of a union. I stood with that union during a work stoppage. So that provides evidence that I would stand with other unions as they try and improve benefits, compensation, um, and working conditions. One of you is going to replace Kirsten Harris as Tally, who had a lot of supporters in the 37th district, decided not to run again after just one term. She actually talked to me about it after she stepped down there, said she felt really frustrated with her efforts towards race and social justice, specifically to police reform getting thwarted there. And Chapala, maybe I can start with you. How do you see the legacy of Representative Harris Talley's work and where might you succeed in these efforts where she was working on, where she, she might have fell short? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that she fell short. Okay. I'd say that like she just got worn down and mm. I really appreciate the adult decision that she made. Like, I think she realized, wow, like I have a lot to give the community. Um, however, this may not be the best place for me to do it right now, and I'm gonna step back. Like, I can imagine many people, like the amount of work we're putting into this is yeah. a ton. Yeah. Once you get a little bit of power and once you get a little bit of status, I can imagine so many people hanging on to that. So the fact that she realized that this may not be the best place for her right now, I deeply respect that. And for me, it's how do, where do you see that she pushed the envelope and then follow behind her? Um, we all have different uh, qualities and experiences and understanding the legacy of those who came before us and then making it better, I think is something very important to understand. And so I'm very appreciative of the work she, that she did to advance social equity um, and racial justice. And so I would love to pick that up and take it from there. One of the things you mentioned was police reform. Like yeah. I was beaten by the police in college. Like that was a really crappy experience. How, so that makes being able to hold our police accountable near and dear to my heart. Like I think just like any other professional um, job, we should have a level of professional accountability. However, we need a police force to partner with that we can trust. Um, and so I think if we thought about public safety a little bit more comprehensively, then we get better outcomes. Like we need counselors in schools, not mm -hmm. cops. Okay. We need um, mental health professionals responding to mental health crises. Okay. And my just same question to you, this legacy of Representative Harris Talley, are you going to be a different leader, similar leader? Do you think you, you can make progress where she might not have been able to as much? What do you think? You know, I appreciate um, Representative Kirsten Harris Talley, I respect her decision. I'm going to be the leader that I've consistently always been, one with integrity and authenticity. Definitely grassroots leader, frontline leader. So a lot of these wins or a lot of policies that Chapalo and I share, I've been out there. Um, when the Black Lives Matter activate, activism was happening, I was out there demanding that uh, we have counselors in schools, demanding that we had education that was reflective of our children. So, and the wins that I would love for us to define what grassroots actually is, but uh, Kirsten Harris Talley, who's also known as KHT yeah. in community, the things that I would want to build on, because KHT was definitely working with a base of community members around our doulas and our health care. Mm. And so health care and health equity is a strong priority for me. And with the Roe v. Wade, um, that being pulled back and understanding that there are deaths, and particularly for black women in our indigenous communities um, just having birth, that our doulas are really vital. So Kirsten Harris Talley led to make sure that the doulas are recognized as a, as a health profession, um, but we need to continue that work to make sure that they can be reimbursed for the services that they're providing. My granddaughter was born in COVID. Uh, my daughter was actually at risk of losing her life for that birth. So that is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, let me stick with you, Amaja, and I need to bring up a sensitive topic here. Your campaign, I've seen this online, has raised some concerns about your opponent's fundraising in this campaign, where the money's coming from. I want to make sure that we can lay out those concerns uh, and let us know about that, please. Well, I will say for my, the fundraising and the campaign and the strategies that I'm using mm -hmm. within my candidacy is really people power. It's a people's campaign, okay. right? So a lot of, uh, we have a strong strategy around the canvassing and doing the things that we can do. There's a lot of low income and working class families in the 37, but the way that they have been pouring into me and supporting me has really been the canvassing and put, putting forth their dollars. I will say that there's been more dollars that are coming out of district right, on the other side. So it looks as though, I'm not, you know, Chapala can speak to himself about his sure. own campaign, um, but it looks like the comparison between the two is like who's rooted, how people can give and how they support versus corporations or um, 
big money donors okay. in a sense. So okay. the, the community in the 37th at least okay. um, is not looking for more status quo. Yeah. They don't want that. They don't want corporations um, really connected into the to our policies and to our laws and, and making decisions okay. for everyday people like myself. Chapal, some thoughts yeah. about fundraising and what's going on with your campaign. Yeah, I'm glad that we're talking about this. Um, I grew up in D.C. and I've been here for 15 years, so I think it makes sense that I would have some out-of-state contributions. Like, I have a strong family, I have a strong friend base <clears throat> that believes deeply in me and has seen everything that I've done, so I am very grateful that folks from D.C. and from other parts of the country have donated to my campaign. Same with folks from Microsoft. Like, I have a 15-year career at Microsoft, and so if I couldn't get my coworkers who have worked for, with me for almost two decades not to donate to my campaign, like, I think that would say something if I didn't have those type of contributions. So, like, in the primary I raised, I think it was, like, $91,000. That was all from individuals. That wasn't from corporations or, like, dark money or PACs or anything like that. That's from people who have worked with me, who have seen the type of leadership that I bring to the table and have confidence that they'll give their hard-earned money. And so, like, when a Microsoft D gives me money, it's great. But when people from the community who may not have as much money give money to me, that is even more meaningful because it's likely a larger portion of their budget and it means even more. So, like, I am honored to have money from everyone and I would like to serve everyone if I'm elected to this role. Thank you for engaging with that. I want to move on to affordable housing with you. And, Chapala, I'll start with you. What's your approach to this crisis going to look like if you're elected? And what in your own personal background impacts your views? I believe you have some properties that you rent out yourself. Is that right? Yeah, I do have a few rental properties. And I'd like to be seen as an example of how you can live progressive values um, and still take care of tenants and renters. So when I look at the housing issue, issues, I see three buckets. One is, how do we stop harm now? Um, the second is, how do we get more units on the market? And then the third is, how do we tie ourselves there? So stopping harm now is anti-displacement. We can't stop people from moving here, and as people move here, our property values are going up. But we got to make sure that the people are here can take part in the evolution of our community. Um, we also need to increase tenant protections. As a small landlord, I've seen some pretty crazy things that landlords can do. So, like for example, we shouldn't use felonies as a means to disqualify folks. Like I have a tenant who's a felon; he's one of my best tenants. I, I would like to be able to speak against that false narrative. Um, landlords can charge exorbitant fees that are predatory. We should stop that. Um, we have a statewide ban on rent control. We should lift that ban and let municipalities choose the tools that are appropriate for their places to fight this um, this housing crisis. In terms of getting units on the market in the long term, we need state investment in low-income housing. The private market doesn't build it because they won't make money at it. We need workforce housing as well. As we've seen just recently, we underpay our teachers, but even two teachers living together can't afford a housing in Seattle. Um, and then we need to invest in mass transit that gets us closer to a greener climate future, but we can also increase density around that housing so we have more units. And then finally, to tide us there, we need housing vouchers so that working people can live in existing market rate units while we're getting those other units online. And then we also need um, temporary rental assistance so a short-term hardship doesn't snowball to someone losing their house because then it's really hard for them to work. It's hard for their kids to go to school. It just makes it worse. Thank you for breaking that down. I, I wanted to make sure I talked to you about this, Amaja, because you have a different background. You've pointed to your experience with the Africatown Community Land Trust. What's your approach to affordable housing for D37 going to be if you're elected? Well, what I share was my experience as a community advocate and as when I was chief of staff of King County Equity Now, using the advocacy of our community voice to go directly to the Washington State Housing and Finance Commission to talk about equity and racial equity and why it was important to make sure that funding was funneled down to communities, particularly in the 37, to make sure that low income housing was provided. And because of that advocacy, and because of the power of our voice, we were able to get funding for the properties that I had just shared with you, Africatown Plaza, Ethiopian Village, Elizabeth Thomas Homes, and mm -hmm. PETA Village. So I'm sharing around the advocacy pieces of that. In addition, I've worked with um, Children's Alliance of Washington, Solid Ground, um, Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, really talking about the basic needs that our families need. And housing is one of those things in order for us to be healthy, in order for us to be stable. I would also want to just add there that there are housing vouchers. We just need more. The housing vouchers aren't enough. We need to expand and make those more accessible for families. We do have temporary um, assistance for emergency housing, but we just need more. We need to open that up 
to other folks who are not extremely low income, but to others who can who also are being very much challenged. I've meeting single people all the time, people who have just come here recently to Seattle and just feel like they have to move out. They cannot stay here. The housing is just too um, inaccessible. Also talking with our seniors and knowing firsthand that property taxes are huge and they are making folks have to leave and sell their homes because they can't afford it. We need more tax exemptions. There is a tax exemption in King County, but it's too low for two seniors to live off of their social security in order to not have to pay such high taxes, which then goes falls onto renters, right? Mm -hmm. And the rents keeps going up. So we, we have shared values here, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the policy and changing the policy, it's the, it's the status quo piece that's a little mm -hmm. bit different, okay. right? Um, and it's about who's on the front line and really pushing for change. And I have that demonstrated experience, okay. again, locked arm with community to make sure that we're, we're really pushing for change. Excuse me. No, no. Th thank you very much for breaking those pieces down. But I wanted to make sure we covered another piece here with public safety. And Maja, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. What do you do in a district that's seen a huge jump in shots fired over the past few years, concerns about criminal activity, but also over policing? I want to talk about this. Many, maybe some specific policies you might be pushing for when it comes to public safety. You know, um, as a teenager growing up here in the historic Central District, really seeing firsthand that field war on drugs, really knowing firsthand what it's like to be over policed as a student just trying to get to class at the bus stop where you're getting pulled over and they're taking your name and they're trying to put you in the database and call you, say you're in a gang, that was me, just trying to get to high school. To, to get pulled over and always being targeted, to have my relatives pulled over, if they say, where are you going, and then just put you in some database. So I know what it means in real life to be over-policed and watch my peers be over-policed, be brutalized and all the things. I don't think so much of that has changed. I'm concerned about the Terry stops that are now coming forward um, from our past legislative session. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about my two black sons every time they go to school just to get on the bus because I know what it's like to be harassed by the police. I also understand though that our police are necessary to keep us safe, right? But we need accountability. So Representative Jesse Johnson, who has led on some accountability and said he's a sole endorser for me. And I've watched with regard to the legislation around the guns, right? No. I'm also a sole endorser, um, been solely endorsed by uh, Alliance for Gun Responsibility to make sure that we are locking up these weapons, right? Don't want to take people's right away to their sense of safety. Mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to be unsafe and I want to be protected. But it needs to come down to community prevention and community safety. And I'm really looking forward, and with regard to the 37, um, working with um, the mayor. Bruce Harrell, mm -hmm. around the community policing policy. They just hired, right, and yeah. decided who the new police chief was, and they're talking about bringing in more diversity mm -hmm. so that we can have more relationship. People can see, be seen in their humanity, not always as being criminalized. Again, needs to be accountability, but what I've learned from being on the King County um, uh, Violence Prevention Coalition mm -hmm. is that our basic needs, people are asking for basic needs to be resourced and that will support around our safety. Okay, thank, thank you, you so that. much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Chipala, <laughs> I wanna make sure that we expand on this a little bit. For thank sure. you for all those thoughts, but uh, uh, some ideas about policy with public safety here, what do you got? Yeah, no, public safety, it's like we all deserve to feel safe in our neighborhoods. And so like, this is exactly a conversation that needs to take the majority of the time. Um, when I was growing up, like gun violence was a major part of my life. Like I lost my first friend to gun violence in the seventh grade, then lost more in 10th, 11th and 12th. So like making sure that we have these common sense gun reforms, I think everyone agrees on this, right? Like it's like 70, 80% um, popularity, but then we have the federal legisla legislators sort of stymied in Congress. We can make change here in the state and make sure that we get these guns off the street. And so I, I, I'm a big fan of proactive measures. So limiting the guns that are on the street, um, making sure that they're locked up, um, doing violence interrupters, um, having 988 so that we have um, a mental health professional responding to mental health crises with a police officer. Instead of having three police officers, we ne now reduce the number of police officers going to an incident so that they can actually go fight crime. And then we have a mental health person leading the interaction so that the person and receiving services receives better services and you in, um, unintentionally train that police officer as they watch the mental health service professional provide those services. So I think if we think more comprehensively about public safety, we get better results. And then we also have to think about the folks who are already involved in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So we impose a ton of fees on juveniles and their families.
families. We should make sure that that's not the case. We should take away that. Um, we should also need to make sure that felons can get housing when they come out of prison because these folks need a second chance. Like if we can't allow them to get housing, what do we think is going to happen? So I think we need to think proactively about how do we stop um, violence? How do we stop people going into the criminal justice system? How do we have counselors in schools instead of police? And then once someone is involved in the criminal justice system, how do we rehabilitate them instead of just being strictly punitive? And then how do we make sure that they have a second chance when they're coming out? Thank you very much for that. We need to wrap up the show here. This has been a great discussion back and forth. It's time for a closing statement. Keep it brief if you can, Chapala, under a minute. Now you're first. Sure, so I'm very thankful. I think both of our hearts are in the right place. You're gonna get a good Democrat out of this race. Um, but my question to folks is who's gonna be the most effective legislator? I've proven success in the private sector. I've proven success in small business. I've proven success um, doing community organizing and I've proven success um, with policy advocacy. So I bring a whole host of, of skills to the table. Um, I work very collaboratively, so I have a set of relationships that I can rely on in Olympia. I also establish relationships very quickly, which is needed in the legislature. I don't care if there's someone that I only agree with 10% of the issues on, let's work with those people so we can get 10% move forwards, and then we can go argue about the other 90% um, after that. So I have unique professional experience with Microsoft and technology legislation, and um, I would love to earn everyone's vote. 41% of the voters provided my candidacy a primary victory. Both The Stranger and The Times, two organizations who don't agree on much, have decided that I'm the best candidate for this job. And so I would love for everyone to come join me on this journey as we need to move our 37th district forward. And Maja, you get the last word. Keep it to a minute, please. Thank you. I would just want to again say that this, my campaign is a people's campaign, and the policies that are driven are people people-powered policies. And I have the demonstrated experience. I've been here the whole district, and I don't know what proven means for Chapalo, but I don't know what Chapalo has done. I think that um, that's been proven and that's been demonstrated uh, with regard to our legislative advocacy. I'm not taking anything away from the great accomplishments of Chapalo, mm -hmm. but when you're in the community and you're in the front line and you're working with the people at all times, then you know what those aspects are. So I I'm looking forward to learning more about what those demonstrated and proven um, policy wins have been. I wanna say that I do have relationships across the district within Seattle Public Schools at the state level. Again, I have um, representative Jesse Johnson, Tara Simmons, um, Mona Doss, Senator Mona Doss, and other elected officials that I've had work, working relationships for a number of years because we've been doing the work. I also want to say when it comes to justice reform, I've been a key catalyst and powerful in Olympia regarding to um, justice reform issues that are impacting successful reentry for our community members and our neighbors. Mm -hmm particularly in housing, want to increase that the housing can be more stable for a year. It was just increased from three months to six months. With regard to our education, making sure that it's fully funded special education. I've been on the special education task force with Seattle Public Schools, help bring forward those recommendations that the SEA was fighting for, for our children. So again, endorsed by One America, Alliance for Gun Responsibility, uh, Washington State Labor Council, mm -hmm. Pew, uh, uh, sage leaders, I mean, you check my website out, you'll see the community members who understand um, that I'm the person that you wanna invest in if you really wanna make sure there's true representation of us who are, have the lived lives and lived experience in the 37. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, appreciate the input from both of you and we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the two candidates running to represent the 37th Legislative District? One writes, 37th LD candidate Chapalo Street, sharp and very well informed, doesn't talk political boilerplate. Another says, Imija Smith is the leader we need for racial justice, housing, healthy families and communities. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Coming up next week, another close race to watch, as affordable housing advocate Emily Alvarado and librarian Leah Griffin face off in the race to represent the 34th Legislative District. Meet the candidates on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us.